Well, good morning. It's good to see you. I'm so glad you're here. I'm glad that uh, part of your new year is, is uh, uh, worship. You know, uh, every, every start of new year, we start New Year's resolutions and, and this kind of stuff. And most of you are regular, but I know with some, you're thinking, okay, our family, we're going to get back into worship. So I'm glad, I'm so glad that you're here. Uh, we have started the new decade, and we're looking at what we're calling Fresh Start. Last week, we talked about God's Word, getting into the Bible, uh, reading it systematically um, at, at the best that we can. So hopefully all of you found a plan, and you're working your plan. If you missed the day this week, do not beat yourself up. I've discovered that when, I, when the Lord nudges me and I, I don't respond, usually my initial response is feeling guilt about that. But I've learned that we have a God who loves us, that next time maybe I won't fall. And uh, I fall forward. And uh, so I want to I wanna be faithful to what he says. So work your plan, go your plan, and, uh, and that'll be great. I grew up in Waco, and uh, in Waco, when, uh, if you were going across, a- as a kid, I remember it more than anything, going across the 17th Street Bridge into downtown around the Franklin-Waco Drive area, for you that are familiar with, with Waco, you would go across that bridge, and I tell you what, you would be hit with an aroma you see, there was a Miss Baird's bread place down there. Oh my gosh. I mean, as soon as you would go over that, you would just smell it and you were thinking, I want bread. I didn't even know I wanted bread. It, it's like popcorn in a movie. I didn't know. I just had a big old plate of enchiladas. Why do I need popcorn? But you need it. And, and, but that aroma would hit you in the freshness and you're thinking, I want, I want bread. I mean, I just want it. You know, I, I've discovered that as we start this new decade and we talk about things like reading the Bible, we're, today we're going to talk about prayer. We start talking about these, these basic, what, what we call spiritual disciplines, these basic disciplines of the faith. We talk about those and sometimes we do it begrudgingly or obligatory things to God, right? God, for you, I'm going to read the Bible this year. I'm going to trudge through it, even through Numbers, even through Exodus. I'm going to get through it, God. For you, I'm going to get through it. Pray, yeah, we're going to pray at meals. We're going to, yeah, I'm going to pray. And, and we, we look at it as this, God, look what I'm giving up for you kind of thing to do these things. And then what happens, let's be honest, we burn out. Anytime you do something with wrong motives, you're going to burn out on it. And uh, so that's what happens. But I, I, I've, I, this is my goal. I want to bake you some fresh bread and just let the aroma go that you say, man, I don't have to. I get to. I, I don't have to read the Bible. I don't have to pray. But man, I get to. And I, you know, it's just like fresh bread. You want to eat it. It's not, it's not bad. You smell that. You want it. And my prayer is, is that you would sense the aroma of the Spirit of God so strong, you're thinking, I want to get to know God better. And that's what I want to do. Um, we're going to talk about prayer for a few minutes this morning. And I know everybody says, ah, you know, I need to pray more. I need to pray better. I, I, need, to, I need to pray because we, we have a misconception of prayer so often. Last week I told you that even reading the Bible is part of your prayer because it's communing with God. And so you, you, uh, him hear, you hearing from him, part of the scripture reading, is your prayer time with him. And they pray the scriptures back as God nudges you. And so you do this. It, it's just part of prayer. But sometimes we get this mystical of you, uh, prayer, and uh, you know we call certain people prayer warriors and, and these kind of things. And, and I understand people have a gift of faith that's strong, but we're all called to pray. And, and uh, in the book of James, even in James 5, it starts talking about healing there. The, he, the prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And it says that Elijah, a man just like us, prayed and after three years it rained. And uh, it says, if it didn't throw in that little clause there that says a man just like us. In other words, he wasn't super follower of God. He was just like you and me, ordinary. And God used him in the answer to prayer. And Jesus prayed. And uh, Jesus prayed um, at his baptism. He prayed when he was being tempted. He prayed when he chose the 12 disciples that would be his, uh, follow closely with him. 
He prayed when he was, uh, uh, he prayed when uh, he asked them the most important question he would ever ask them, who do, who do men say that I am? But who do you say that I am? He spent that night in prayer before he asked them that question. He definitely spent night in prayer before he went to the cross. And uh, the disciples took notice of this. They noticed that he prayed often and he, he prayed uh, intimately. And out of that prayer, he received life. Uh, it's almost like, I, I, also as a kid, I, I used to watch a TV show called Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea. Any of your, does that bring back a memory? Uh, or the Jacques Cousteau stuff, or any, any uh, uh, thing that's underwater gear. But I remember they, when they do those deep dives, they would wear those clunker old deep diving bells, uh, 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 uniforms or, or underwater devices, and they would have a connection which would be up the top that would be putting oxygen into them so they could breathe at those depths. And when I think about that, I think, you know, that's what prayer is. We are living in the depths here, and our lifeline to God is prayer. And when that prayer gets cut off, what we do is we live it under our own power, under our own strength, and we're getting the results of it many, many times. And so what happened, and I want you to turn with me to, to Luke's Gospel, chapter 11, if you would. Uh, for you that are new to the Scriptures, the Bible's in the Old Testament and the New Testament. This is in the New Testament. You got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the first uh, four uh, segments there. And uh, Luke uh, writing, Dr. Luke, account uh, um, of the life of Jesus. And in Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 13, I want to read it. And I want us to see this passage when it comes to prayer. They could have asked Jesus anything. And they have specific things that they want. Luke 11, verses 1 through 13. Let me read it all, and then we're going to come back and see what God has for us in the midst of this. Very practical today. Verse 1. Now it came to pass, as he, this is Jesus is talking about, as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. And so he said to them, when you pray, say, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us day by day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And he said to them, which of you shall have a friend and go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves. We're talking midnight here. For a friend of mine has come to me on his journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within and say, Do not trouble me. The door is now shut, and my children are in bed with me. I cannot rise and give to you. I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence... He will rise and give him as, as many as he needs. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. And to him who knocks it will be opened. Let me say a quick word and then I want to read the last couple of verses. Where it says in verse 9, ask, seek, knock. In the Greek language, it's a uh, continuation. In other words, keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking, keep, keep up in your prayers, Get, go at it. And, and some, well, does that, does that show a lack of faith? I mean, we pray for, no, I mean, you're going to pray daily. At, keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. That's what God wants you to do. Verse 11, if a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask of him? The disciples could have asked anything. I mean, they saw Jesus speak. They saw him do miracles. 
They saw him confront the Pharisees and the religious leaders and put them down. They, they, they saw him at day in, day out. They watched him intimately, and they could have asked him, Jesus, would you teach us how to preach? Would you teach us how to teach the way you teach? But they wanted the most important thing, and it was this. Jesus, would you teach us how to pray? And I thought about that, and I thought, you know, they watched Jesus. They saw that his lifeline was to the Father, and it was the most important thing to him. They watched him day in and day out, and how he spent time with the Father, and out of that relationship came power. And so they were asking, Lord, please teach us to pray. They had, here's, the, here's the interesting thing. Most of these were Jewish boys, right? They were all Jewish boys. They had learned prayers, but they hadn't learned how to pray. Hey, that was good. That's tweetable. Uh, <laughs> they had learned prayers, but they had not learned how to pray. I think many of us have learned prayers, but we haven't learned how to pray. What I want to do is for a few moments using this passage, I want to get very strategic that I think is going to help you in your prayer life. My prayer is that you catch the aroma of prayer. You don't walk out of here feeling guilty like, oh, brother, I got to pray. I want you to walk out of here. I get to spend time with the creator of the universe. And so the number one point that I wanted you to write down is this. Let prayer be part of your rhythm. Let prayer be part of your rhythm. Uh, there was times that Jesus pulled away to pray, and then there was times that he prayed right in front of the disciples. There was times he prayed uh, with others. I mean, his prayer was just part of his rhythm of life. And we need to let prayer be part of our rhythm, consistently a part of our daily life. In other words, we're not always thinking, man, I haven't prayed today. But we're spending continuous time. Let prayer be continuous. Let it be part of your rhythm. Let it be daily. Let it be consistent. Let it be your lifeline and your source that you get. Um, for me, personally, uh, the first 30 minutes of my day, every day, this is crazy, except on Sunday because the dog doesn't wake up as early as I do. But when I get up, the dog and I, Put on her harness. It doesn't matter if it's 20 degrees or 80 degrees. We're going. And uh, I harness up the dog, and we're out for the first 30 minutes of the day. Now, the first 30 minutes is me connecting with the Father. Yeah, it's walking my dog. There's no neighbors to talk to at that time. But it's just my connection with the Father. It's for me to go over the Scriptures in my head. It's for me to just be with the Father. It's... Uh, I, Tomorrow, I'll have one of these praise songs on my mind. It's just me connecting with a father that first 30 minutes. It's part of my rhythm. Uh, it's not going into some special place. It's just me out with the father. And yet the dog just happens to be my, my method of getting out there. So that's, that's part of it. And some of you have other rhythms. Some of you uh, drive and you're stuck in traffic for about 30 to 45 minutes a, a minimum a day. Instead of cussing, <laughs> pray. Use it as part of your rhythm. Pray with your eyes open, but pray. And that, let it be part of your rhythm. There's other rhythms you have in your life. Shaving, you know, you're able to pray. as you. Uh, I know you pray at your meals, but don't let that be your own prayer time. You know, let it be part of your life. Let it Pray without ceasing. Just let it be, uh, be part of you. Before you put your feet on the floor, maybe before when the alarm goes off in the morning, instead of just jumping up before you put your feet on the floor, just breathe a prayer. God, I want to be used of you today. Take my mind, take my hands, take my mouth, take my feet. God, I just bring this before you today and just let it be part of your rhythm. I think about the students at school. Uh, I assume you still have some kind of bell system that uh, dismisses classes and tells you when the next class is going to be. I, I always look for triggers of reminders. Let that be a reminder to you as that, as that bell goes off. Just breathe a prayer to the Father. Father, I pray for this class. I pray for the teacher today because they're, they're going through a lot of stuff. And uh, I just pray for my classmates. Use me for your glory. Just let it be part of your rhythm instead of oddity. 
You know, uh, uh, here's another one right quick, just, just to throw it out at you. If somebody comes up to you and says, hey, uh, or they come up to me and say, Mark, uh, I need you to um, pray over so-and-so. Uh, it's hard at the door on a Sunday morning. But if somebody comes up to me out in public or out and says, Mark, would you pray for me? There's, there's one of two things I can do. Most of the time we say, yeah, I will pray for you and never do it. But I have just... Part of the rhythm for Pam and I has been, okay, we'll pray for you right now. Before we get off the phone, let's pray. Because uh, we just want it to be a part of the rhythm. So allow prayer because it was part of Jesus' rhythm. And let it be part of your rhythm of life. Don't be forcing it, but let it be part of your rhythm. Number two is this. Remember prayer is relational. Let's read the prayer that Jesus put forth here. And let me say something about this prayer. We call it the Lord's Prayer, but really it's the disciples' prayer. He was teaching the disciples how to pray, and he wasn't giving them the structure of something to memorize and just spew out. He was giving them a skeleton of the things that are important in prayer, and you put the meat on the bones, okay? So that's, that's what he's giving here. So let's, let's, let's look at that and how relational it is right quick. He said this in verse 2. He said, when you pray, say this, our Father. There's no more intimate term that he could have used than Father. It's a relational term of endearment. It's a relational term of authority. It's also that term of someone that loves you unconditionally and, uh, and is there for you. This was the hardest thing for me to learn about the Scriptures. My father died when I was 15 months old. I never called anybody dad or father in my life. And so when, when I'm trying to learn about father, it was kind of foreign to me until I became a dad. Now you learn that father, what it's all about. And, and that's the way prayer is. It begins with just recognizing that I'm in a relationship with the creator of the universe who loves me more than anybody will ever love me. And he cares for me. And it, as Brett said, he has our best interest in mind. Our Father. And then he says this, who art in heaven. That's, that's a pretty important term. Let me just be candid with you. Worry still, worry and angst and fear sometimes creep into my system. And if I'm praying for somebody or I'm praying for the situation that I'm in, that worry can just encompass me. If you've ever had a family member that's wandered from the Lord and you're trying to pray that they come back to the Lord, you pray and you don't see the end, right? You can't see the outcome. And when we say our Father in heaven, it means, Father, you have a vantage point that I don't have. You see it from beginning to end. You see the motives of the heart. You see this thing that I cannot see. So from your vantage point, Father, I come and recognize that you are a holy Father and you see all things, that you're trustworthy, and so I can come and bring this to you today. Isn't that good news? That he sees it all? You know, if you've lost a job or something, to know that uh, the Father sees the next job, and you can trust Him with that. He sees health. He sees these things. He sees that prodigal son or daughter coming home. And you can pray knowing that He sees it from His vantage point. So our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Hallowed, I've never used in a, in a sentence in my life other than the Lord's Prayer. So what does it mean? Hallowed means set apart, sanctified, holy. Um, he is control of all. That when we cry out to Father, this is how relational intimate it is. Our Father, you see it from your vantage point, And you are holy. You are sanctified. You are all powerful. This is who you are. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. And then he says this, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is still part of that relational thing. You see, a day's coming, people, when Jesus is going to return and he's going to set everything right. That his kingdom will ultimately be completely established. New heaven, new earth. Jesus will reign. That day is coming. He's not saying pray for that day. 
He's praying for today that his kingdom would be right here today. Lord, your kingdom, your will be done. What's done in heaven, Lord, may it be done on earth. As I'm praying for our political system, Lord, may your kingdom come, may your will be done. When I'm praying for the church, God, may your kingdom come, may your will be done. We're praying for our family. We're praying for our world. God, your kingdom come, your will be done right here today. And so you see how relational prayer is? It's coming before the all-powerful Holy Father who sees you inside and out. This is always scary to me. He sees my motives. I can act pretty good. But he knows the motive of my heart, and he still loves me. And I'm coming before the Father with that kind of relationship. Uh, I've talked to you before, before about cat and dog theology. Uh, dog theology is this, from the dog's perspective. You feed me, you care for me, you take care of me, you play with me, you must be God. Cat theology, on the other hand, from the cat's perspective, you feed, for, you feed me, you care for me, you play for me, play with me, you take care of me. I must be God. I think we approach the king of the universe with too much cat theology. We think it's about us. So what do we do with God? Knowing that he's bigger than I am, we just come with a wish list instead of concentrating on the relationship. There are times, folks, we need to just come and ask for nothing other than just being in the Father's presence and call him our Father. I've, I've said this before, too, that if reincarnation were real, which it's not, I would come back as our dog. It's a great thing to be. There is not a need or want in the world for our dog. Our dog's name is Gracie. She's what you call a cavapoo. She is a mixture of a King Charles Cavalier Spaniel and a poodle because somebody has allergies, and uh, we had to get a hyperallergenic expensive dog. <laughs> but Gracie, here's the way Gracie is wired. I don't know if it's the, the spaniel in her or whatever. If I come home from work at the end of the day, I will come in. She hears me. Uh, here's my car. She will be at the door. And it's, it's as though I've been gone a year. I mean, she's going crazy. I have to sit down with her just to get it out of her system of how Okay, there we go. So, Gracie, if I come in at the end of the day, she just, um, she's just going crazy. Now, if I walk outside, take the garbage from the garage to the street, come back in, takes three minutes, it's the same way. She just goes nuts like you've been gone forever. I mean, it's like, and I, I know, I wonder why God created cats, but it's obvious with dogs. It's obvious with dogs. They, they were created as man's best friend just, just to be there. And I think, I, I don't want to call us dogs, but, but we were created for the Father's good pleasure. And I tell you what, it, that silly dog, every time she does that, I could have had a terrible day. And it just, it just does something to me. And I think there's something, God never has a bad day. But when we come to him for his good pleasure, it just blesses his heart. And he just wants to spend time with us. So you see how relational it is. Number three is this. Pray according to God's will. Pray according to God's will. Uh, the scriptures go on and start talking about things we need to start asking for. Uh, we need to say, uh, Lord, give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our, our debts or sins or trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. There are certain things he wants us to pray that are according to his will. But i got to be honest. 
We have no clue what it means to pray for our daily bread. When was the last time you actually prayed about your next meal? Never. And I'm not saying where we're going to eat lunch today. I'm talking about really your daily need. And what Jesus is getting across is we want to have such a relationship with the Father. It's, it's not so much about food. It's so much about dependence that we are dependent upon him. Father, give us this day our daily bread because it's his will that he wants, to, wants us to be so close to him. Man shall not live by bread alone, by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So we, we draw near to him. That's his will. It's his will that we walk in unforgiveness not, not only our own uh, forgiveness, but that we forgive one another. That's his will. It's his will that none perish but all come to repentance. It's his will that uh, we overcome the evil one so he doesn't want us walking. We, we need to learn to pray according to his will. If you do not know him, you don't know how to pray according to his will. We just pray what we want. Give me this, give me this, give me this, give me this. And we're always disappointed. Oh, God doesn't love me. Really? I've learned more through hard times than I ever learned through affluent times. Does that mean God didn't care? I I, I don't know this for sure, but God may be in more layoffs than job hires just to draw you closer to him. So we need to learn to pray according to God's will. And as we stay in his word, that's where we do these things. Last one right quick. Pray with others. Pray with others. And I'm going to get very strategic here. Pray with others. And I know somebody will say to me, Mark, uh, did Jesus not say in the Sermon on the Mount, when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Did he not say that? Yes, he did say that. And at what Jesus was referring to there is that you need to be able to pull away and just be with the Father in, in those times. You need those times. However, you remember before he ascended, what did he tell them to do? Go and wait. And while they wait, they were to go and pray. They were to pray together in an upper room. So he told them to go and pray, and they went and prayed, and the Holy Spirit came. He told them other times to pray. Peter's in jail. They gathered to pray together. When... when uh, um, Acts chapter 2, 42, and it starts talking about what they did. They gathered regularly for prayer. Yes, there's a need for uh, alone prayer, and then there's a time for praying with others. In fact, the scripture says, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in their midst, is what the scriptures tell us. So there's a a need for for praying together. So I want to just right quick, I want to give you Areas of prayer for your life that are very practical. Number one is, is, is this. I call it just daily prayer. This is for you. This is your daily prayer. This is part of your rhythm. God, I'm connecting with you today. You're my lifeline. You're my source. Lord, I'm just connecting with you. Uh, however that works for you. Um, I, I, you know, people say, well, Mark, don't you think there's a, a best posture to be in to pray? Don't you think I ought to be on my knees or on my face or standing or, or what should, how should I pray? I, I remember the story of the, the, the two pastors who were discussing this and, and they were standing outside and they were saying, oh, I believe the best place is on your knees. You got to be on your knees. And the other one said, no, I believe the best is, is just standing with your hands held out to heaven. And they didn't realize, but they were standing right by a power pole and there was a guy working on the power pole up there. And he says, excuse me, guys. He said, I've discovered the best way to pray is hanging from a wire from 20 feet over ground. And so you're going to pray whatever posture you need to be in. So it's not a matter of posture. It's a matter, let me put it this way. It's not a matter of physical posture. It's a matter of the posture of your heart. You're coming daily to connect with the creator of the universe, your heavenly father. So daily prayer. Second of all is what I call couple prayer. If you are married, one of the most strengthening things you can do in your marriage is have prayer together. And don't elbow anybody right now. My wife had to do it with me to wake me up in this particular area years ago. 
it's one of the most intimate things you can do is couple prayer. If you're not married and, um, and uh, you have a, a prayer partner, that's great. I, I, I ask uh, our staff to make sure they have prayer partners. But, but uh, couple prayer is, is powerful. For Pam and I, we pray just before we go to sleep at night. Uh, it's part of our rhythm, and so we, we do that. And uh, what we do is something very simple, very simple, because you can't pray around the world every night. Uh, last night being Saturday, we pray specifically for the services today, for anointing on teachers, on the singers, on the worship team, on the ushers, greeters. We pray for everybody. We pray for what's happening this morning. Tonight, we pray specifically for our family by name. And uh, we pray for all of them. No matter how big it gets, we pray for our family. Uh, Monday nights, we pray for ministries, those particular ministries that are coming up, things that are coming up, we pray specifically for them. Tuesday, we pray for our neighbors. We pray by name for our neighbors, by name on Tuesdays. Wednesdays, we pray for world missions. I, I love it when we have missionaries come here, and I'm able to tell them specifically, Pam and I pray for you by name every Wednesday night. And uh, so Wednesday is World Missions. Thursday is a night of Thanksgiving. Uh, and then Friday is for friends. We, uh, we pray for friends. And uh, I, I back up. Part of my daily prayer is for you through the directory. I pray a part, a certain families in the directory every day. And so uh, th- this is part of my, our couple's rhythm. So you got daily for you, couple prayer. Thirdly is what I call community prayer. Um, Like I said, with our staff, I ask everybody on our staff to get three people to uh, pray around them. I have three men that uh, pray for me daily. They pray for my wife. They pray for my family. Uh, We have three. But this is just part uh, of the community prayer. You have a Bible fellowship. You have a small group, ladies group, men's group, whatever You need to have prayer. Every Wednesday night, there's a group called Prayer and Praise that meet up here at 6.30. It's a group you have. Community prayer is very important, so I encourage you to find others. Some of you have Christians that don't go into Central, but you work with them, you go to school with. Use that time uh, to come before the Lord together as community. So we got daily, we got couple, we got community. And then the the fourth one, last one is this. I call it Central Prayer. Um, pray for Central, pray for the staff, but there's some things specifically that I want to challenge you on today. Prayer and praise was one that I said, uh, we as a staff pray every Tuesday. That's a huge deal for us. Uh, altar prayer is huge to me. Not all churches is altar prayer that big a deal. Uh, some churches are too big to have it. Some, uh, don't see the importance of it. Some, uh, have other ways of doing this. I, I, let me just share my heart with you right quick. I believe in altar prayer. Uh, at the end of this service, there will be elders, pastors, prayer teams up here to pray with you. We also have the Lord's Supper. These steps become an altar. You hear me say that all the time. Just being transparent. I pray. Gosh, this is hard to prayer. I pray for brokenness every Sunday. And you're thinking, well, Mark, I'd rather have joy. You know what's on the other side of brokenness? Joy. God, break me of my sin in my life. Lord, let me detest it. Lord, break my heart over broken relationships I've allowed to happen. Lord, may I be broken over some things in my life. And sometimes the only place I can get broken is on an altar. So I believe in that strongly. So central... As long as I'm your pastor, we will have an altar and, and uh, people to pray for us. But other, two other things. When you came in, you should have got uh, two handouts in your uh, bulletin. If you did not get them, you can pick them up afterwards. I'm not going to hand them out right now. But there are two prayer movements that we're involved in. You see, my prayer always is that we not be a church that prays, but we be a praying church. Trey, uh, Trey Kent, who is a friend of mine, and his wife, Mary Ann, had an incredible vision several years ago about praying for the Austin metro area, which is five-county area of uh, Austin. 
And uh, Trey and Marianne, Trey uh, pastors over at Northwest Fellowship uh, here in Austin. And uh, the vision was this. How do we make Austin, the Austin metro area, the most prayed for place in America? And he had this vision that if a church would take a day of the month, in other words, 31 churches would take a day, that it would be continuous prayer for the Austin metro area. We got on pretty, pretty quick in this. And uh, not only that, but they soon filled up the 31 and, and their uh, uh, redundant days that they're doing, which is perfectly okay. We're just wanting to make sure it's all covered. We're committed to the second Monday of each month. Tomorrow is that second Monday. Some of you have been faithful to it. Some of you have dropped off on it. I'm not here to, of guilt because we're re-upping brand new what we're going to do. There's two ways you can sign up. You sign up for 30-minute increments. You pray at your house. You don't come up here. You pray at your house, and uh, you can pray at any time. We would like 12 to 12, but if we don't do that, that's perfectly okay. There's two ways to sign up. One, if you go on centralrr.com, right, don't go right now. I was going to say right now, but you'd do it. But the first thing you're going to be greeted with is uh, unceasing prayer sign up. What you do is you just click on that. You pick the time, 30-minute slot, and you pray. And what you go through is right here, these, these, uh, these prayer points of unceasing prayer. Number two, if you don't want to sign up online, you walk out of here and you walk right to the left and uh, there is a manual sign up. You just sign your name up on the hour or the 30 minutes that you want to do and you just do that. Church, we are praying for revival. We're praying for revival all over the Austin metro area. I do not want to hear about it from somebody else. I want to be in on it. And I think this is what puts us in on it. So sign up. I want you to sign up and uh, just do that today, please, because we're praying tomorrow. You will, you will uh, start receiving an email on that when it comes up the second Monday. Number two, you've got what is called Pray the Rock. Pray the Rock is specifically for Round Rock. Uh, it's a prayer movement that started out of Love the Rock, and uh, every month... You, uh, uh, we get a new uh, items to pray for. This particular, this month, which is this month, is the business spear and the healthcare spear. They, there are people who actually contact these areas and get the specific prayer areas, prayer needs. Now, how do we do that when we're doing the unceasing prayer? The way we're doing Pray the Rock, it's not a a 24-hour-a-day thing. What we're doing is the second week of the month, I'm asking that your group, your Bible fellowship or your small group or your family or whatever, would just spend some time praying over Round Rock. Simple. The second week of the month is huge for us. The second Monday is unceasing prayer. The second week is uh, Pray the Rock, just any time. I mean, we can take time on Sunday morning, but this is what we have. These are just practical ways to get life from the Father as we breathe out prayer to him. Lord, let your aroma come. I end with this this morning. If you do not have a relationship with the Father, it's hard to pray. If you do not know him, if you do not understand that he loves you so much. You see, we start saying, oh, there's no way he can love me. I'm living in sin. I'm doing wrong. No, no, he loves you. He loved you so much that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross for you. Jesus was perfect. He died on a cross for you. He was buried. Three days later, he rose from the dead. And anyone that would put their faith in him has life, has forgiveness, has a new start. And if you've never done that, today is your day. Today is your day. But here's the last thought. I I had this picture when I was thinking about praying, and I saw on this large parking lot area, I saw this um, uh, vintage car. I saw a new car. I saw a motorcycle. 
and I saw an airplane all on this, I don't want to sound mystical about it. I mean, I basically, I was daydreaming, and this is just what I saw. I saw the vintage car, I saw a new car, I saw a motorcycle, and I saw an airplane. And they were just sitting there. They looked good, but they were just sitting there. They weren't doing what they were supposed to do. And the thought came to my mind, a vintage car runs on fuel. A new car runs on fuel. A motorcycle runs on fuel. An airplane runs on fuel. They cannot do what they were created to do if they do not have fuel. They're just looking good. Our fuel is our prayer. Yes, it's the Holy Spirit, but Jesus said, how much more will your loving Heavenly Father give you the Holy Spirit to those that ask? It's His fuel. Central, we can look real good and be doing nothing until we connect. Bow your heads with me. Thank you.